Well, welcome back to our class, and we're going to look at something called celestial distances today. And when we look at chapter 19 in our textbook, it talks about how far far can get. Uh, so our lecture today is really far out. Uh, yes, that, that's about as good as the jokes get today. So we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. Uh, see how many of you can get that reference if you're old enough like I am to remember that song and that movie. You might actually get some extra credit if you send me the, where, where it comes from. Uh, but uh, we're going to look at chapter 19's PowerPoint here. If I can remember how we share the screen. I've got several screens up here. There we go. There we go. Chapter 19. So let's take a look at the slideshow from the start. Some of these things we've covered a little bit before already. Uh, when we're talking about stars, we're talking about things that are far away. Uh, when we're talking about groups of stars, typically they're even further away than if we just talk about stars. We can talk about stars and groups of stars, and the truth is some stars are further away than some groups of stars. Uh, we typically call groups of stars clusters, uh, and there are different types of clusters that are out there. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well as we go along. But some things can be closer, some things can be further away. When we talk about galaxies, plural, they're all outside of our own galaxy. Uh, so, so except for the one or two that we've eaten and we're digesting, but we really consider those now to be part of our galaxy. Uh, but depending upon how far something is, we're also looking at it back in time. And I think we've covered a little bit about that as well. This is a globular cluster. Uh, there are dozens and dozens of them around our uh, galaxy. Uh, I think we're up to about 150 of them, if I'm remembering that number correctly. That number varies because we discover more and sometimes we demote one because we found out it was something else. Uh, not That demotion doesn't happen quite as much as it used to, but the number does vary. These are the oldest parts of our galaxy. And as you can see, it's about 28,000 light years away from Earth. That means the light that we're seeing off of this, it, it originated from it roughly 28,000 years ago. The number 28,000 light years is an interesting number because that's also about how far away we are from the center of the galaxy. This is not at the center of the galaxy. If we are here, 28,000 light years in one direction to the center of the galaxy, the globular cluster is probably 28,000 light years up in here, or it could be 28,000 light years over here. It could be any which way around our galaxy along the way. Uh, but this is M80. There was a catalog uh, by a Frenchman a couple hundred years ago named Messier, uh, who went through the nighttime sky that he saw from his location, so we're talking Northern Hemisphere here, and just made a big catalog, first time anyone really took the effort to do this, of things you might see through your telescope and think you've discovered something new. Because people kept discovering the same things over and over and over again and announcing, oh, look what I found, and it turned out they, that had been found a bunch of different times already. So in part, perhaps out of frustration, he put this together. Uh, it was a, a, a really interesting idea, and we still use the M numbers for some of the major things that you can see through a low power telescope, because a couple hundred years ago, uh, that was all they had back then. We talked a little bit about the, uh, the transmission of light. As light goes out further and further and further from something, it's actually going out in all directions. It's going out in three dimensions if it's coming off of a star. Uh, so, so it's going out in every, every direction of space. And it's spreading out. The luminosity spreads out, so it becomes dimmer and dimmer and dimmer the further out you are. And it dims by the square of the distance. So if it's two times as far away, you're getting one-fourth of the light. If it's three times as far away, you're getting one-ninth of the light. So remember that we have this, this uh, luminosity, brightness, and distance guide here. Uh, very simple calculation. I'm not going to make you do a lot of calculations, but just be sort of aware of the relationship that we have here. Math is actually very important, not just in terms of the calculations and the data that we get, but also it shows the relationships of different things. And what this shows is how bright the star is, the luminosity, by the distance gives us the brightness. 
And of course, the further away something is, you're dividing the luminosity by higher and higher and higher numbers, the brightness goes down and down and down. You can rewrite this equation like this, so that if you know the distance and the brightness, then you can get the intrinsic luminosity. If you just know the intrinsic luminosity and the brightness, you can get the distance. You can, you can rewrite this equation so that if you've got two out of the three, you can get the third. So if we're looking at Alpha Centauri, if it were three times farther away, well, it would be one ninth as bright. Remember that, it goes off by a square. So how far away are these stars? Well, that's a good question. Uh, this is actually the Orion Nebula. You might not recognize it because it's on its side. See, here we have our uh, three stars in the belt. We have the Orion Nebula down here. This is Rigel, which typically when we're looking at it in the sky is going to be on the bottom right. And this is Betelgeuse over here. Usually it's at the top left. Uh, so one of the things you should remember when you're looking at any kind of image of the, the, the stars in space, up is not always north. We can reorient it in any number of different ways. So uh, here we have our brightest stars. Well, guess what? They're not all the same distance. So that becomes an issue along the way. I've talked about the parallax trick before where you sort of close one eye and put your thumb up and open your eye and things jump along the way. Things that are at stellar distances really don't show up in parallax. Uh, we, even when the Earth is all the way over on the other side of the uh, 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 orbit around the sun. So if we were looking from here, we would look at this red star, for example, and these would be the distant stars that we would see rather than these distant stars. That doesn't really happen. It doesn't happen with any of the bright stars. It doesn't happen with the naked eye. It takes extraordinarily sensitive equipment to measure even for the nearest of the stars for us any kind of possible parallax uh, along the way. So parallax depends upon distance. And the further away something is, the smaller the angle, which means by the time we get out to stellar distances, they're just simply too far away for parallax to really work. Uh, but what we would do, this really works with the moon, this works with comets, this works with asteroids, this works with planets, doesn't work with stars so much. But what we would do is we would take two different pictures and we would do uh, what we would call a blinking uh, comparison. So, so we would sort of watch for which stars seem to have moved uh, quite a bit. And it's like, well, these two stars look like they're about the same. These two stars look like they're about the same. Uh, but, but when we sort of look at this triangle here, it might look a little bit different from this one. When we look at this over here, this looks like it might be a little bit shorter than this one here. So, so this is what people used to do actually manually, is they would take pictures and other pictures and they would sort of flash them back and forth. Uh, that was something that a lot of astronomers did through, through much of the history of early astronomy. And in fact, this is the kind of blink test uh, that Clyde Tombaugh used to discover Pluto. Of course, Pluto is much, much closer than our furthest stars. If we were looking at a nearby star that had parallax on, in July, we might see it among these stars. In January, we might see it in these stars. But again, really none of the stars that are close to us, even the ones that are closest to us, are going to have anywhere near this kind of parallax. This star might jump to a little bit over here and then a little bit over here. And, and again, it takes extraordinarily sensitive equipment to figure that out. But when we're dealing with parallax, again, we have mathematical relationships. The angle that we're getting can be measured in parsecs by this equation here because a parsec is actually 3.26 light years. The reason why we measure things in parsecs is because it's related to the parallax angle. So it's, we, we, it, it's, it's the amount of jump that we would have between our two observations half a year apart. And to get light years out of that, we would use this equation here because this many light years is in a parsec. Uh, Roughly speaking, again, this is a, a close approximation. 
Uh, so, so we will mostly deal in light years rather than parsecs in this class, but I wanted you to be aware of this as a distance element that's out there as well. One of the ways in which we can do that within the solar system, the ways we can measure things, is when we have a transit of a planet like Venus going across uh, the sun. I was able to see this with my own home telescope on, uh, on uh, uh, the, the event in 2012. Uh, not, it wasn't a major event like the solar eclipse just a couple of years ago, uh, but it, it was something that a lot of people were sort of intrigued by because this doesn't happen very often. Uh, it happens a couple of times a century on average uh, along the way. So, but what we can do when we're looking at this is we can take measurements from different parts of the Earth. And this is one of the ways in which we learned the scale of the solar system uh, again, a couple of hundred years ago, uh, people realized that when Venus goes between us and the sun, if we're not wobbling too much, because sometimes we miss it, it's not in a direct line across, that's why it doesn't happen every orbit. Uh, we wobble and it wobbles along the way. But when it's in front of the sun, as it was in 2012, if you're way up north here on our planet and you look at Venus, you can see it crossing the sun closer to the equator than if you're down south here looking at Venus, it looks like it's closer to the pole. And if you can measure the distance between where you're looking at it, north and south, you can measure on our planet the distance, because uh, that's easily done, then divide that in two and put this straight line up here, that gives you a right angle. So now you have half the distance that you've measured between your two observations, and you have a right angle. Well, with geometry and trigonometry at our disposal, if you have the distance, or the length of one side of a triangle, and the angle of another, or uh, one of the angles and one of the sides, you can calculate the other angles and the other sides. And we know this is a 90 degree angle because when you're splitting a triangle in half like this, you get a 90 degree angle on both sides here. And you know the distance, so voila, we now know the distance to Venus. And we can use the reverse trick over here for the distance of Venus to the sun. And then we can tell the size of the sun. And we can do all of these, you don't even need calculus for this along the way. So, this is more or less what I got to see uh, when we were looking at the transit a couple of years ago. I guess it's now eight years ago, uh, almost exactly eight years ago, if you're watching this when I'm recording it in June 2020. Uh, so so it, 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 was, it was rather interesting. I didn't do any, any uh, parallax measurements because I wasn't teaming up with anyone else. But on the internet, there were lots of people who were chaining the, their observations, people in the southern hemisphere with people in the northern hemisphere and doing their own sort of home astronomy just to sort of verify both what people outside are thinking as well as to calibrate their own equipment, uh, uh, which, is, which is rather interesting. So we can do this kind of measurement within the solar system also with radar. Uh, we send, uh, we beam some radar waves out, uh, radio waves out, and they bounce back and they get received and we can measure the distance from that. But again, stars are way too far away, plus the, the, the uh, radar waves would not bounce back from them. That, that would not happen with, with, with those kinds of things. But what happens when we do this, it's actually quite extraordinary. We can beam things out that are sort of the equivalent of all the television stations in the world uh, off towards, say, Mercury. And the signal that we get back is uh, uh, diminished by almost a million. Uh, we get maybe a tiny, tiny blip back because things dissipate as they're going off. Remember, if, if I'm sending out a beam, it's going to weaken, 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 and then when it bounces back, it weaken, 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 weakens again. It falls off by that distance of a square, as we talked about before. So all of this works with what we might call triangulation, and this is actually one of the ways in which people have been measuring things for a very long time, this triangulation and parallax kind of trick. This is something Julius Caesar used to do 
to figure out how to build a bridge across a river so he could get his troops across. How do you know how many trees to fell? Well, you don't want to come up short. You don't want to waste your time cutting down too many. Uh, so he would figure out how far across the stream it was and, and voila, the Romans were actually very good engineers uh, when, when we were dealing with those things. Uh, some of the key people who are starting to figure out how far far can get in terms of beyond our solar system because we could do the Venus trick and other other tricks to let us know what's happening inside of our solar system. We have uh, some people named Bessel, Struve, and Henderson. Uh, uh, as you might think with Friedrich, you see they were in the German uh, cat, uh, culture. Uh, German astronomy, German science was, was a very uh, powerful part of the history of astronomy during the particularly 17 and 1800s uh, into the early 1900s when a lot shifted towards uh, the English-speaking world, uh, in part as lots of Germans left during the uh, various wars that were happening and came to the safety of North America along the way. But uh, we have uh, measurements to stars like 61 Cygni in 1838, uh, 61 Cygni, Cygnus is one of our 88 constellations, and 61 is just simply that's the 61st star that was cataloged in that constellation along the way. Uh, this is an important star in other ways, uh, and an important constellation in other ways, because as we'll see later when we're looking at uh, black holes and pulsars. Uh, but, but again, uh, parallax is part of our stair stepping towards the sky. We often will use parallax to something that's close and then go on from there with what we would consider to be the cosmic ladder. I'm not going to read all this to you. This is actually from your textbook, so you can, can uh, read about it directly. But this talks about a little bit more about parsecs. Again, parsec is the distance of parallax at one second. So it's sort of how, again, we have 360 degrees in a circle. Each degree is 60 minutes. Each minute is 60 seconds. So if something jumps by one arc second, uh, what, what, what we would do is we would say that that's what, it's, what a parsec is. That's how far away it is. Uh, so it's a very, very long way away, 31 trillion kilometers. Uh, they're there. It's 260,000 or 206, sorry, thousand AUs. Uh, my Sidlexia is getting to me there a little bit along the way. Uh, I'm, imagine how big this is because Neptune is only 30 AUs away from the sun. So 206,000 AUs. A parsec is a long, long way out there along the way. But again, mostly I, I, I put that in there because I want us to be complete in our information. We won't really be using parsecs too much in this class, but just be aware that they're out there. We will mostly use light years because that tends to be the, the sort of the standard thing that most people know and talk about when they're talking about uh, distances because it's a little more conceptually easy to grasp. Light travels at 300,000 kilometers per second. It travels at 186,000 miles per second. So we talk about the, the travel time of light. Uh, something that is one light year away, it takes, it takes light one year to get from there to here. The moon is one light second away. It's actually a little bit more. It's like 1.3 light seconds away. That's why when you listen to the different kinds of, of uh, NASA broadcasts of the moon landings and you hear they say something, then there's a one Mississippi two, and then you get the response, and then there's a one Mississippi two before they get, there's a drag time there. The sun light coming off of the sun is eight minutes away. So if the sun blew up seven minutes ago, we wouldn't know for another minute. That's not always a reassuring thought. Uh, Sirius, the brightest star in the sky at night, is eight light years away. So that means the light that's coming off of Sirius is eight years old. If they were watching television broadcasts from us on a, a, a planet around Sirius, if they had televisions and they had the right HBO access codes and stuff like that, they would be seeing things from 12 years ago or eight years ago from 2012. So, so they, they don't know what's coming. 
Uh, they don't know what's about to hit them there. Uh, so, so the Andromeda galaxy, they wouldn't even be getting any television broadcast yet because we've only been sending out uh, Honeymooners and I Love Lucy and other things for about 70 years, uh, maybe 80 years now in terms of, of regular television broadcasts. Uh, the Andromeda galaxy is more than 2 million light years away. So the further away we're looking, the further back in time we're looking along the way. Uh, so, and, and the light year is 10 trillion kilometers or 6 trillion miles. Remember, a parsec is 3.26 times this amount along the way. This is how we get what a light year is. We have 300,000 kilometers per second. Well, we have 60 seconds in a minute. 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Uh, we don't worry so much about leap years and, and leap seconds and other kinds of things like that. We Close is good, especially when you're dealing with numbers this big. Uh, so this is how many kilometers it is. In, and we can round this up uh, e essentially to 10. Uh, I know it's uh, 9.46, but that would be 9.5 and then we would round 9.5 up to 10. So most of the time people say 10 rather than nine, as you will see in this slide before. Um, so don't ask me why. Well, ask me why. Usually we go to two significant digits for a lot of things of this nature. Here we have the Orion Nebula again, or the Orion Constellation, the Orion Nebula being right in the middle here. And this is in its more usual orientation. Uh, we have Betelgeuse at the top, and Rigel down here at the bottom. Uh, we name things after what's in it. So basically this entire uh, lightened area here is sort of the county map around the stick figure of Orion. So these would all be considered stars in the, the Orion constellation, even if they're not part of the stick figure. So even these stars in the middle here, even these stars off to the side here, we would classify those as stars or objects in Orion. Sometimes they're not even stars. Again, here it's our, our guy Messier, who was putting together his catalog a couple hundred years ago. Uh, he, there were some fuzzy objects. Well, that turned, in, in this area here, it turned out to be the Orion Nebula along the way. Here's a chart. I've got a couple of charts of some of the nearest stars to us. Uh, you can sort of see as, as these sort of things go out, these circles go out five, 10, 15 light years away. Uh, not too many things within the five light years away. Uh, that, these are not just sort of flat spatial. Think about these as being spheres around. So Alpha Centauri, as you can sort of see, is down here. Notice we would see it best from the southern hemisphere. Um, you, you miss it in sometimes from the northern hemisphere. Uh, as, as we're sort of looking out, we can see a number of stars that are uh, might be known to us through other things like Wolf 359. Who are my Trekkies in class? Wolf 359, what happened there? Well, when they were talking about the Borg coming to take over the Earth, they had their big stand with the Federation and the Borg at Wolf 359. They did not make that star up uh, in, for Star Trek. They picked one that was there. Here's 61 Cygni. Notice that it's not too far away. So, so we're, we're talking about that as ba being basically within the 10 light year range that we have. Uh, so, so, and then we have our other major stars around, including Barnard's star, which is one that is very, very hard to see because it is one of the closest stars to us as well, but it's also a, a dwarf star, uh, which is going to give us very little light. And it's also one of the ones, because it's closest to us, that seems to have the biggest proper motion. It seems to move faster among the backdrop of other stars, uh, faster than others. Notice something that's over here by Wolf 359. Here's Sirius. This is the brightest star in our sky at night. Notice it's about eight light years away from us along the way. So Wolf 359 is also in that same neighborhood over there. Here we have another chart of the nearest stars, the 45 nearest stars. Notice our stellar types. Remember the O, B, A, F, and all of that sort of stuff. Here Alpha Centauri has three. We have our Alpha Centauri A and B plus Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is a K star. It's a very dim star. Notice how many dim stars we have that are among these here along the way. 
Notice that Sirius is an A star. So we don't have any O stars that are really close to us. We don't have any B stars that are close to us, but we have a bright A star that's here. Uh, and, and then we have uh, some, some uh, F stars here. And when we're looking at our, our other stars here, K, our Cygni uh, stars here, that's actually a double star that we're seeing here. We have uh, some, some triple stars, some trinary stars. But double stars we often call binary, triple stars we call trinary. But this you can sort of see how far away they are. Barnard's star is sort of our second closest, very, very dim star, an M star, uh, very hard to see. Most of our nearby stars, uh, as, as uh, uh, plotted by the Gaia and the Hipparchos missions, both of these were uh, missions that were sent up into space, uh, supported largely by the European Space Agency, but also uh, backed up by NASA. And, and a lot of things like this end up being uh, collaborative works, but someone takes the leadership, European Space Agency, plotted out uh, hundreds of millions of stars uh, and, and, and are still working on some of the plotting. This is 16,000 or more stars uh, and we were able to measure some sort of kind of parallax with them again by getting up above the atmosphere with hypersensitive equipment along the way. Uh, but uh, we have Hipparchus which gave us uh, 120,000 stars along the way. Uh, the Gaia mission is, is still operating and it is looking to observe a billion stars, but it's looking to observe a billion stars 70 times each uh, uh, along the way. Uh, and, and one of the things, I guess I, I really need to check to see if the Gaia mission is still in, in operation. It, it should be still in operation, but um, it, I, I haven't checked it out in a little while. So uh, take, take that with a minor grain of salt there. Uh, but it's one of those, uh, when, when you think about the size of our galaxy, there are maybe as many as two to 400 billion stars that are out there. If we observe a billion of the stars that are out there, that means we have still not looked at 399 billion other stars as a possibility. So there are lots and lots of things that are out there. Again, we have our brightness and luminosity uh, relationship here. And what we're trying to do when we're looking at things that are far away is we're developing standard candles. A standard candle is something that, okay, we know that is X amount of brightness. So whether it's this close or this close, we can tell what it is. If you give me a hundred watt bulb and I plug it in somewhere, I can walk down the road and look at it and know it's a hundred watt bulb. So if I did a measurement, from down the road, I could tell how far away it is because I know it's a 100 watt bulb. If I don't know how bright it is, that becomes a different issue. Well, one of the things that is, is very useful to us are variable stars. And one of the types of variable stars are CFID variables. And CFID variables go up and down in their brightness. And they go up and down in their brightness predictably. This one here would be, say, a, a fairly typical one. It goes up and down over the course of six days. Not all of them have six-day uh, 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 periods along the way. One of the best known CFID variables, one that gets brighter and dimmer, is Polaris. Polaris is our pole star. It's at the North Pole. So it's been known to be brighter and dimmer for a very long time. Through most of human history, when people would notice it was brighter or dimmer, they almost always thought it's user error, it's variation in the way I'm looking at it, or it's atmospheric. Well, there are too many clouds, there's water vapor, there's something. They didn't have the idea, really, until the, the, the 20th century, that stars might intrinsically inside of them get brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer. We didn't know that that was a possibility. But as we look at these, what happens is they are all the same brightness in terms of getting brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer, depending upon what their period of brightness and dimness is. So if it's six days, up and down, up and down, up and down, and you've got one here, but you've got one way over here, 
then you know this brightness equals this brightness because they're both doing it in six days. If you've got one over here that's doing it every 10 days and one over here that's doing it every 10 days, you know those are the same brightness because the same thing is operating inside of them. That's a clue to what we would call a standard candle. So when we look at these things, the longer the period of up and down, the greater the luminosity. And we can sort of tell what the luminosity is against the sun. And if it's a very short one, like our little six day one here, it's going to be low in terms of luminosity. If it's a longer period variable, then it's going to be a very bright one that's up there. One of the persons who helped figure this out uh, was a woman uh, named Levitt, Henrietta Swan Levitt. Uh, she was someone who worked as one of the uh, data crunchers and later uh, 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 more elevated up to being recognized for her research abilities. She looked at the different photographs with often those kinds of blink tests that I mentioned before uh, for stars in the Magellanic Clouds. Those are those two galaxies that are really close to us that we can see in the night sky when we're down in the Southern Hemisphere. Well, they took a lot of photographs there and she noticed that sometimes there were brighter stars, sometimes there were dimmer stars, and that sometimes they did that brightness and dimness in a pattern. There were 20 different CFID variables. Now, here's the thing. Since they're all about the same distance, they're all in the same grouping of stars, we could then tell the ones that were going up and down faster or the ones that were going up and down more slowly in, in their variability, we could predict then how far away they were going to be based on that. And that gave us another standard candle for how far away it is. This candle is this bright, this candle is this bright, this candle is this bright. And then we could just measure between the candles. And, and so it's almost uh, uh, not quite boost, bootstrapping, but it is sort of linking back and back and back. This is a picture of the Large Magellanic Cloud. Again, we would see this as a sort of a splatter galaxy. And one of the things that this, this helps us to do is to look at groups of stars that are roughly the same distance. I mean, again, we're going to have some variation because this is three-dimensional, uh, uh, but, but by, by the time we're talking about this, they're all pretty much about the same distance. It's like if I'm talking about houses in Seattle or houses in Los Angeles, well, Los Angeles all the way across that metro area can be a couple hundred miles away. But from Indiana, they're all 3,000 miles away. So, so it's, it, you don't worry so much about that. All of these stars are about the same distance away. So when we see them perking up and down and up and down, uh, that is something that uh, gives us a clue about the standard candles. So you can actually do your own kind of measurement with these sort of CFID variables. Uh, you can plot your own things with a telescope. You can sort of measure if you get even just basically some uh, a little bit of home equipment. Uh, you're not really going to be able to do it too, too well with naked eye observation uh, unless you're really, really good and you get really, really adept. Uh, at that, but if you use a computer, because uh, most of us are not Henrietta Swan Levitt, uh, and even she used photographs uh, along the way. If you use photographs, which we can now actually chain from even home telescopes into our computers, we can then plot all of these things. So this is actually something that used to be, when we go back to Bessel and Struve and Henderson, used to be oh, earth shattering. We have figured out how to measure the distance to stars, that you can now do it in your bedroom kind of thing. So uh, John Goodrick, John Goodrick is one of my uh, 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 favorite historical figures in astronomy as well, uh, because he was also someone who was a sort of child prodigy. Uh, he was at the age of 17, someone who started figuring out that some stars might not just be brighter and dimmer than others, but some may change their variability, they may change their brightness, they may be actually intrinsically variable. Um, he was someone who was looking at the star Algol. I may have mentioned the star Algol as one that's pulling material off of its companion. So, so one of the things that we, we, we see is that he made an observation, 
it wasn't actually proven for about a hundred years later. And unfortunately, he died at the age of 21, very, very young. Uh, who knows what other kinds of things he would have gotten into in terms of scientific discovery had he lived. Uh, but, but he got a, a medal from the Royal Society. This is about as good as it gets. This is sort of, uh, I would say, this period's equivalent to the Nobel Prize. Uh, when, when he was barely a teenager. So, so I mean, uh, it's like, this is, this is remarkable stuff. So if, if you're thinking about final projects in this class, uh, one of the things that's perfectly acceptable to do is to pick a person. Uh, John Goodrick would not be a bad person to highlight uh, in those kinds of things. But as we can see, he was starting, uh, you can sort of see the dates for his life back here, uh, notice it overlaps with a very important event in American history. Uh, so if you think about the American Revolution, that's the same time frame as John Goodrick lived. Uh, then we have Henrietta Swan Leavitt, who was in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s doing this. This has been a several hundred year hunt for these things that we call CFID variables. Uh, we, we also have some dimmer stars uh, that are called RR Lyrae stars, and, and they are also uh, a, a type of star. CFID variables tend to be near the end of their life as big and bright stars. RR Lyrae stars uh, tend to be on the dimmer side along the way. But as we're, if we remember our HR diagram, uh, we have our stars that are along here. As they run out of hydrogen to convert into helium, they go off the main sequence into this instability area here. And this is when many of them will become variable, sometimes until they extinguish themselves, or sometimes for a period of their sort of post-main sequence development. These have been useful because Henrietta Swan Leavitt was able to use that CFID variable stuff in the Magellanic clouds to begin to plot some distances. Back when she was doing that, she, in fact, she died in 1921. 1920 is the year of the great debate. So this year, 2020, if you're watching this video when I'm making it in 2020, is the year 100th anniversary of the great debate. Are there other galaxies? Or is the whole universe just one galaxy? And there was a big event that took place where people were trying to figure this out because Hubble hadn't come along yet and figured out that there were other things that were out there. Because when you look at galaxies through low powered telescopes, and they were high powered for that time period, but they are, were fairly low power for what we have today. You can't sometimes tell the difference between a gas cloud that's closer or a big galaxy full of stars that's further away, uh, especially if your photography isn't that great and your telescope in the beginning is, is, is somewhat fuzzy along the way. But Hubble figured out from these variable stars that there were some that were popping up and down and up and down and up and down, but they were doing it so far away, they had to be outside of our galaxy. And he was measuring some of the CFID variables in the Andromeda galaxy, which back at that time was considered a spiral nebula, because they could tell it was a spiral uh, design, but they didn't know back then that there were, there were other galaxies that were out there. And he was measuring things not 30,000 light years away or 50,000 light years away, but he was getting figures in the millions of light years away, and people are like, that's what you just know it can't be possibly that big. Well, it turned out, uh, yes, it could be. So we could go from our solar system where we can use radar and parallax to the nearby stars when we get really, really good stuff with like Hipparchus and, and Gaia, uh, where we can tell uh, what, what uh, the, the parallax is. We can figure out how dim or how bright they might be intrinsically. Then we can use the stars that we know how bright or dim they would be from the masses that they have by looking at the HR diagram. From that, we can go, we call that main sequence fitting. Uh, then we can go on to CFID variables, which get us to nearby galaxies. And then we have yet other standards that take us further and further away, including this. This looks like a very simple diagram here. 
This is one of the early diagrams showing the Hubble relationship, and we call it after him all still. To this day, we have the Hubble Space Telescope named after him. This is really what unlocked the true size of the universe as we know it today. What's happening is as we're looking at the light that's coming off of the most distant galaxies that are out there. So the further away they are, one of the things that Hubble was picking up is they were more and more and more redshifted. Remember we talked about those lines, those spectral lines coming off of the stars, and if they're shifted towards the blue, they're coming towards us. If they're shifted towards the red, they're going away from us. Well, as we're looking at the CFID variables and further and further and further things, we're also seeing the redshift is further and further and further into the danger zone, uh, where you can think about what song or what movie that comes from too. Uh, so, so what we could then extrapolate from that is that the further away they are, because there comes a point where we can't notice the red, the, the, the CFID variables blinking on and off. They're just too far away for us to notice uh, the variability. But we can still see the light coming off of things and it's still giving us the redshift. And the further away things are, the more they're redshifted along the way. And that's what we call the Hubble relationship, the Hubble's law. Hubble's law tells us that the more redshifted something is out there in among the galaxies, the further away from us it's going to be. And it's a very simple calculation. The Hubble constant times the distance is related to the velocity that is here. And that means the further away it is, the faster it's going. So our universe is expanding. This was actually something predicted by Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein's uh, general uh, special theory of relativity was in 1905. His general theory of relativity was in 1915. The great debate was in 1920 between whether or not there's anything out there. Einstein predicted the universe could be, perhaps even should be, expanding, but he didn't like that result, so he introduced something into his equations that made it balance out so it didn't look like it was expanding, that he then later was able to take out once Hubble came along and said, they're expanding. Uh, so, so Einstein is reputed, I'm not going to verify this because there is a little bit of, of dissension among this. He's reputed to have said his biggest mistake in his life was to put that constant in there and to mistrust his equations that the universe was expanding. Uh, so, so there are all sorts of interesting things that are out there. So now we use this chain of techniques, radar to parallax, domain sequence, to CFID variables, to Hubble's law, and there are some other distant standards that we'll also be talking about later in the semester. So that's how big the universe is. Ta-da! Uh, I hope you've enjoyed our trek through the universe. Uh, we'll come back to some of these things when we're looking at some of the more distant galaxies. Uh, but I believe for our next round of stuff uh, in chapter 20, we'll be looking again a little bit closer to home, not in our solar system, but in our galaxy, of the stuff that happens between the stars. So we'll look at gas and dust and other things, and we'll see what else is out there apart from the stars. Stay tuned. <laughs>